Welcome. Welcome. Yes, let's applaud. Welcome to Dominican University of California, and it is a pleasure to be the partner of Book Passage, who helps to bring these remarkable people to Marin County. And do we have a remarkable person here tonight, or what? I, I wonder if those of you in the audience were here last week when Vice President Gore was present. Were you? Let me see your hands. Were you here? Fabulous. Well, you, this is even better. I, <laughs> it is really a joy to have you in the hall. My name is Denise Lucy. I'm the director of the Leadership Institute here and a professor of business. And the great, uh, the great, I had a great opportunity to have 35 fantastic student volunteers tonight. Could we thank them for giving up their evening? Because this lecture series has become really an important community program for us. We get to welcome our neighbors, and we are, we're thrilled to be in dialogue with you about important topics. This is a leadership lecture series across the disciplines. And we have, the, we have the joy tonight to hear from Secretary Madeleine Albright. And not only will we hear from her, talk about a leader. Elaine Petricelli, founder and CEO of Book Passage, will be interviewing her. And she's Marin's leader, isn't she? But we could not do this partnership without the support of another important community member, and that is private ocean wealth management. They have been our lead sponsor now for oh, almost a couple years now, and we are so help, thankful for them, to them for their help. Private ocean wealth management is the uh, largest wealth management firm in Marin. It was named seven times by Worth Magazine as one of the top 100 registered investment advisors nationwide. And because of their chairman and founder, Mr. Richard Stone, who is also a trustee here on our board of directors, we have the wonderful opportunity to have them welcome you to our campus. Just to say a few words about Mr. Stone, he is the recipient of the prestigious Charles Schwab Impact Leadership Award for Lifetime Achievement to the financial planning industry. And as the chair of our finance committee and a member of our investment committee, he helps to keep us in good stead. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Richard Stone, who will introduce our speakers. You have a treat tonight. She's a wonderful lady. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Leadership Lecture Series hosted by Dominican's Institute for Leadership Studies and Marin's leading independent bookstore, Book Passage. This evening, Secretary Albright will talk with us about her fascinating new book, Prague Winter. She'll be joined in conversation by our dear friend and partner, Elaine Petrocelli, CEO of Book Passage. Prague Winter is a memoir of Secretary Albright's formative years in Czechoslovakia during the time of Nazi occupation, World War II, fascism, and the onset of the Cold War. We'll hear an intensely personal journey into the past, as well as vital lessons for the future, all told by one of the international community's most respected and fascinating figures. Madeleine K. Albright was the 64th Secretary of State of the United States. Serving from 1997 until 2001, she was the first woman to hold that position. During her tenure, Dr. Albright was known for her strong commitment to democracy, arms control, human rights, and peace in the Middle East, Africa, and other regions of conflict. She played a, re a lead role in forging America's successful response to terror and ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, and was a forceful advocate of bringing war criminals to justice. Since leaving office, Dr. Albright has authored three New York Times bestsellers. Currently, she serves as chair of Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategy firm, 
and Chair and Principal of Albright Capital Management, LLC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Madam Secretary. lucky to, to be up here with you. I'm just thrilled. Uh, it, one of the things I wanted to just mention about Prague Winter is that for me it was not just a great history and a history of a time particularly that I thought I knew until I read your book and then I found out that I didn't know very much at all. But it's also a personal journey and it's putting the two together I, I've never seen a book like that, so thank you for doing that. Um, the history of Czechoslovakia is, of course, one of great strife and great heroes. And I'd love to know a little bit more about how Czechoslovakia became a nation after World War I and became a democracy. Well, it's great to be here with you, Elaine, nice to, and very nice to be at Dominican. It's a wonderful place, and I'm honored to have been asked to come here. Um, Czechoslovakia was a very interesting country in that it was formed as a result of World War I and a very close relationship uh, between those two countries. What um, Woodrow Wilson's principles in 14 points played a great role in this. What was interesting was the first president of Czechoslovakia was married to an American. Uh, and he did something that most people don't do today, is he took her maiden name as his middle name. He married Charlotte Gehrig, and he was Thomas Gehrig Masaryk. The Czechoslovak constitution was modeled on the American one, with a significant exception in that it had equal rights language in it in 1918. Um, and it was a country that was created out of pieces of what had been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so there were Czechs and Slovaks, but there also were some Poles and Hungarians, but also, and most significantly, there were very large numbers of Germans uh, that lived in the, the northwestern part, or south of Germany, called Sudetenland which played a very large part in the history of the country. And so this brand new country, and frankly the only democracy in Central and Eastern Europe in the interwar period, became kind of the center of a lot of the playing out of the beginning of, of World War II. I grew up, you were saying you didn't know some things. I, this book is about the fact that at age 59, I thought I knew who I was, but it turns out I didn't and also that I thought I understood really the country that I had been born in. And so in the course of all this, putting the story together, I found out an awful lot more about Czechoslovakia also, uh, the motivating factors, how it operated in terms of coalition governments, how it tried to deal with what was this mixed ethnic group, and how in many ways it became the victim of great power diplomacy where agreements, Munich agreements specifically, was made by the British and French over the heads of Czechoslovakia uh, with Germany and Italy, and the country was sold down the river. And when it was sold down the river, it, it felt that the president had thought he had allies, and the Russians said that they would uh, stand up for Czechoslovakia if the French did, and then the French wouldn't. Uh, I think about that and I think, how could this happen? It seems so wrong and yet it just seemed that it unfolded that way. Well, I think that, and, and I, you know, I grew up uh, understanding that Munich was one of those genuinely terrible events in history. Uh, and there are many people that talk about the Munich syndrome that, uh, but with the years and also with having had the experience of being a decision maker myself, I kind of began to take a different look at it. And what I think is interesting is I didn't realize, had not realized, the extent to which the British and French were exhausted from World War I. They had lost a lot of men in that war. 
uh, and they would have done anything to keep the peace. And uh, also, there was an underestimation of who Hitler was. I think that, and I can understand why, nobody could imagine the kind of uh, barbarism and uh, cruelty that came out of that man and the people around him. And so, if you look at the history in terms of the kinds of things that happen in the middle 30s, um, that these people that were so tired of wars were kind of willing to give in to what Hitler wanted. So it, they started to give in when he took a piece of, of the Rhineland, and then when he um, created this agreement with Austria. And then he, just one more thing, he wanted to get those Germans that were part of Czechoslovakia to be part of the Third Reich. And so they kind of gave in on that. So I, I can understand, I hate to say this, but I can understand that a little bit more than I did before. We are tired. Mm -hmm. from Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, people get tired of sacrificing their young men and women for war. So that part, then the other part, and this is what, to, to get to the point that you asked, what had happened was that the French had a treaty with Czechoslovakia, a non-aggression treaty, which said that if they were attacked, that, that France would come in and help them. The Russians, the Soviet Union, had a treaty that said, if the French help you, we will come in and help you. And the result of this and the actions, in fact, then affected post-World War II Czechoslovakia. So what happened was the Nazis marched into uh, Prague on March 15th, 1939, and the French decided not to do anything about it. The Soviet Union then said, well, we don't have to honor our part of it. But they said, we would have if the French had. So what happened was that the West, the Czechoslovakia, which I had said earlier had been so pro-American and Western, all of a sudden felt left, let down by the West. And the Czechoslovaks were never anti-Russian, particularly the great Slavic mother. So then, in fact, they some of them thought, well, the Soviets would have saved us if the West had, and that affected very much the kinds of things that happened after World War II. Indeed. And your father was an ambassador, and you spent the war in, mostly in London and outside of London, and I know that you were a very little girl when you went, but I, I was very moved by the part about your cousin being uh, brought to England on the train all by herself and leaving her family alone. The, could you talk a little bit about her and that yep. family? Well, let me just explain. What happened was my father was a young diplomat. And, and to go back to one of the first questions you asked, my parents were basically the first generation of people that lived in Czechoslovakia. And I remember asking my parents, were we Czechs or Slovaks? And my parents said, you're a Czechoslovak. They really saw themselves as that. That they were patriots, that's what they believed in. And so my father's first assignment was as press attaché to Belgrade. And then when the war started, he got out and uh, joined the government in exile in London. He was the person in charge of all broadcasts into Czechoslovakia from BBC. And so that was my, my parents. Then um, my father's brother was also um, in England. He had been, he was a businessman, and so his family was there. And then what happened was it became evident in, after the Nazis marched in and in the 40s, early 40s, that Jews were going to be um, punished. And by the way, I didn't know anything about being Jewish until I, in 1996. But, what I now know is that what was happening was there was this kinder transport, but there also was another train created by this wonderful British industrialist, uh, Nicholas Wilton, who, by the way, is still alive. He's 102, um, who created a train for other children. And so my father's sister's children um, were going to go on the train. And so what happened is that the older sister, my cousin, went, but uh, the younger sister, her parents decided that she was too young to go. And what happened was ultimately she and her parents were taken to concentration camps and were killed. 
Um, and so my, I had spent time with this older cousin of mine uh, just a couple of summers ago, and she said something that she would never forgive her parents for was not letting the little sister go. But I uh, describe this whole thing in terms of the difficulties of making um, moral decisions, because the parents thought they were saving her from a complicated life of being just a little girl living in England. And so that, that is the story. The older cousin, Dasha, spent time with us in England, and then she came back to Czechoslovakia with us. Uh, and then she did not want to leave with us in 1948 because she was, uh, had a boyfriend whom she later married, and she wanted to stay in the country where she was born. Uh, and I, I know that you lost 25 members of your family in the Holocaust. Uh, did you know most of them or as no. a little toddler? Well, this is the part that's so hard to explain. For me, I left uh, Czechoslovakia when I was two years old. And I know that I spent time with my grandmothers, but I don't remember them. For me, it is just photographs. And so when I was talking to this cousin of mine uh, in getting, doing research for the book, she said, well, as I used to say to grandma and grandfather Babichka and Dedeček in Czech, and it occurred to me I had never called anybody that to their face. I never, so for me, I, I, now that I'm a grandmother myself, I think, how is that possible? But I had no real relationship or with any of those people that are in the photographs. And so, and I have to explain how this all, how I found all this out. What happened was when I was ambassador at the United Nations uh, and I became a public figure, I started getting letters from people and people saying, I'm your relative, send money or a visa, you know. <laughs> uh, and then I would get letters from people that would say, I knew your father, he went to high school with my father in 1915, which would have been impossible since my father was born in 1909. And, um, or they would have the wrong names of the villages or whatever. In 1996, uh, just as my name had come up to be Secretary of State, I got a letter from somebody that had all the names and dates and villages and everything right. And it said something like, uh, my family knew your family and they were a fine Jewish family. So. And this was literally as I was being vetted by the White House counsel. So I'm there and they ask me the normal questions like, had I paid my taxes and did I have a nanny? And then um, <laughs> they, uh, uh, and at the end they said, is there anything, we asked this of everybody, they said, is there anything that you'd like to tell us that um, we haven't asked you? And I said, well, look, I just got this letter and it's perfectly possible that I'm of Jewish background. And they said, so what? The president is not anti-Semitic. So um, over the holidays, I, I talked to my three daughters and their husbands, and they were fascinated. They already loved my parents and thought we had this fairly complicated story. And so for them, it was endlessly fascinating. And then you're not allowed to talk to the press between the time that you are named to office and the time you're confirmed. And so there was a reporter from the Washington Post, Michael Dobbs, who wanted to do a profile of me. So my office gave him names of people and things. And so the first week that I was Secretary of State, he comes into my office and all of a sudden he starts giving me these disgusting documents, which are the cards. The Nazis were very organized. Yes. Um, cards that had the names of, of various people from my family saying what date they had been shipped to concentration camps. And I'm kind of, it's one thing to find out you're Jewish, it's another to find out that in fact, very large numbers of my family had been sent to concentration camps. And I found it hard to believe, but here were these documents. And so I could not go to try to find out the story by myself because I had to actually prove that a woman could be Secretary of State. And um, so uh, that, uh, um, so I asked uh, my brother and sister to go, and they were taken around by this wonderful man who's now become a very personal, close personal friend, Thomas Krauss, who was head of the Jewish community in Prague. And he took them around and began to, to put the pieces of the story together. And so um, that's how I first learned about this, and was not able, and the only way I can describe how I felt, it's as if 
I'd been the first woman ever asked to represent my country in a marathon, then to, as I was about to start out, be given a heavy package and told to unwrap it as I ran. So I, there's nothing could have been more thrilling than to be named Secretary of State, and nothing could be more devastating than to find out about my family. And so putting those pieces together was what the first weeks were like. And you, wrote, you write about it beautifully. I, I've read a number of, as someone who is Jewish, and have cried over a number of books about the Holocaust, and your description of the families and what, how the people organized, and the children uh, could only make me think of the day I cried in Prague in the museum with the children's drawings. But uh, amazing. Um, just and by the way, that little cousin that didn't go, some of her drawings are in the museum in Prague. Yeah. Yeah. And there you were in England, and the Blitz is going on, and then your family move you moves a little bit out of London where you might be safe, and along come the doodle bugs. And uh, do you remember those? Oh, that coming? I really do remember. I well, it's interesting. I do. We lived in London during the Blitz, and uh, we lived in this big apartment house that was full of as refugees at the time, and uh, we would go down to the cellar um, when the air raid uh, siren started. And I remember my father saying at some point, well, it, we have to go down here, but there's hot water and gas pipes, so if the building gets blown up, who knows? But the bottom line is I went back there not long ago, and I went to the apartment where we lived, and I said something stupid like, is the cellar still there? And they said, yes. Uh, and the, the woman that was um, lived in the apartment, she said, but we're having a terrible argument with the superintendent because they will not fix that cellar. So she said, would you like to see it? And I said, yes, I went. So we went down. And all of a sudden, I had one of those the ugly green paint that I remember from being a child was still there. We then did move out to this little town called Walton-on-Thames. My father was an air raid warden. Uh, and, um, and I do remember the doodlebugs and also sitting in air raid shelters at that point and singing 100 green bottles hanging on the wall. Um, and um, and uh, then things like, um, how did the chickens in the backyard uh, drink when the, uh, when the bombs were falling? But I, the thing that makes me different from my American contemporaries is that I actually would come out of buildings in the morning and see destroyed uh, buildings and hear bombs. And it really obviously had an effect on my life. It had to. And how fortunate we, we are that we have a Secretary of State who knows what war is. And then your father's job in London of beaming the radio from the BBC back into Czechoslovakia, wasn't that dangerous? Wasn't he? People want to find him. Did they know well, that he I, was the one? I think I, that is nothing that I ever had a feeling that that he felt danger. But what was interesting was when they went home after the war, people would because they didn't broadcast under their own names, and so um, people would say, "We thought that was you by the sound of your voice and the things that you'd said." But what was complicated in England was the following thing. There were a number of countries who had governments in exile in London. And the problem was that the British did not want to recognize them as the official government, partially because it meant an abrogation of the Munich Agreement. And there were a number of legal aspects to that from their perspective. So one of the things that they all did, and President Benesch, who had been the last the president of Czechoslovakia, was there kind of in limbo for a while until there was recognition. And then one, the other part that's complicated was that a group of Czechoslovaks was in Paris and another group of Czechoslovaks were in Moscow. And the part that was interesting about Czechoslovakia in that interwar period, by the way, the, the Czechoslovaks had no nobility. They'd all been thrown out the window in 1348. Defenestration is one right. of the ways they dealt with things. And so it was a country that was um, basically some middle class, a working class. And what was interesting was that they had a legal socialist party and a legal communist party uh, during the interwar period. So a lot of the communists went 
to Moscow during the war, and then other parts of the government um, or various, most of the government was in London. But the real problem was what was their status? Um, so that was something that my father and his colleagues worked on. My father was, the part that's always very hard is we all think of our parents as being old. The bottom line is my parents, when they left to go, were in their early 30s. And so now trying to figure out how they coped with all of this and how they operated is something that I speculate about a lot. And they never talked about it. Never, this. no. But after the war, when... Uh, you went back, did you, uh, and then I find it just quite amazing that there you were, uh, and your father is the ambassador to Yugoslavia, and later you are there during the whole Bosnian wars, settling the most horrible things happening. Uh, I think you must have gotten something when you were there as a little girl. I know they sent you away to boarding school, but would you tell the story of the emerald ring that your family yeah. received? Well, what was interesting was my father, as I said, before the war, had already been press attaché in Belgrade. Um, and uh, during this, what happened, he came back to Czechoslovakia in May 1945 and was chief of staff to the foreign, in the foreign ministry. And then in the fall of 1945, they made him ambassador to Yugoslavia. My parents both uh, spoke Serbo-Croatian, and, and they loved being there, despite the fact that it was devastated. I mean, Belgrade was devastated and a uh, very poor country run by Marshal Tito. And, um, you know, the little girl in the national costume that gives flowers at the airport, that's what I did for a living. <laughs> um, and... Uh, you know, it was very, uh, and, and my parents did not want me going to school with communists. So I had a governess, and I got ahead of myself, uh, because in Europe you can't go to the next grade until you're a certain age, and so that's when they sent me to Switzerland to school. Um, but when we were there, um, the Czechoslovak embassy, by the way, had been gutted during the war, and had served as... Gestapo headquarters. So when my parents went back, they kind of had to put the place back together. Uh, and the part that was so strange, and has been strange in my whole life, and especially it's one of the things that I admire my parents for, is how they went from having nothing to having something, then having nothing again. So they had come from fairly well-to-do families, but then we were refugees in England. Then that's over. Then we go to the embassy in Belgrade, where they're drivers and chefs and things, and then again they became refugees when we came to the United States. Uh, but the story specifically, Tito uh, was um, uh, somebody that had fought bravely during the war, um, and my, one of the first things that my father was supposed to do was to get a treaty between Romania, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. And he did manage to pull the, the, get the treaty together. And my mother used to tell this story, is that after the treaty was signed, they all went to the uh, house of the president. And uh, partisans, still in their kind of fatigues, came into the room with silver trays and on that were little velvet boxes. And they were giving rings to the wives of the ambassadors that had just negotiated this treaty. And so my mother was born in, with the birthstone of the wife. So my mother was born in May, so she got this ring that had an emerald and 14 diamonds in it. And uh, my father was appalled, and he, it, he said, so I wonder whose finger they cut that off of. Um, <laughs> so anyway, they had the ring, and when I finally got my PhD, uh, my parents gave me the ring. So I have Tito's ring, uh, and I wore it. When I went back, uh, I was in the Carter administration, and when we went back for Tito's funeral, I wore Tito's ring. So, yeah. It seems a good time to wear it. <laughs> but what is interesting is what you pointed out. Life is very, very peculiar. And the fact that the major thing that I had to deal with uh, was what was happened uh, as you, former Yugoslavia uh, fell apart and the horrible things that were going on there. And I really did have an understanding of it. My father had written a book called Tito's Communism, 
Um, and I, that's what I grew up with in, in many different ways. I understand Serbo-Croatian, uh, and it was interesting as I was uh, talking, one of the amazing parts, I mean, it's so great being Secretary of State, and you always have an interpreter with you, and you uh, work through different languages, but I understand quite a few languages. So uh, I had the advantage of hearing it twice. Um, and so as the, the Serbs or the Croats were talking to each other, I always, I understood it. And, um, and it, what was very difficult for me was my father loved the Serbs. And he said, if he weren't Czech, he wished he'd been a Serb. And the problem was that the Serbs, when I was in office, were doing, some of them, Milosevic, were doing terrible things to the Bosnians and the Kosovars. And the Serbs would get very mad at me, and they'd say, your father loved the Serbs. And I said, that's true, but not the kinds of things that Milosevic is doing now. Um, and so I did understand what was going on. And as I say, life is strange that out of this background, that would be the major thing that I would be dealing with. My, my mother would say Bashert, I think, meant yeah, to be. Yeah. And I had never understood until I read your book how this democracy got lost again after World War II. And the, the players, the communists, the Democrats, the, the son of the first president, this wonderful humanitarian, murdered. I, it's just... If you tried it in a movie, no one would yeah. buy that movie. It'd be too much. It, it's a huge tragedy, but it goes back to a question that you asked. First of all, the country was sold down the river. Nobody, there were no Czechoslovaks there at Munich. Um, so, and then an, a different theme in my life is what is the role the United States plays? So the United States was not at Munich. Uh, in 1938, we, you Americans were looking inward. When Americans came into the war, everything changed. I remember that as a little girl, American soldiers coming, everything changed. When as a result of agreements made during World War II, General Patton's army only got 45 miles into Czechoslovakia and, quote, the Soviet Union liberated Czechoslovakia. So the theme in my life is always, you know, what happens if the U.S. is not present? So. Uh, but part of it also goes back to the couple of things I said earlier. First of all, that the, the Czechs were made to believe that the Soviets would have honored a non-aggression treaty if the French had not let them down. And then the fact that there was a legal Communist Party. And so what happened at the end of the war was that um, there was an election in 1946 that the Communists actually won. They had a plurality, and they linked up with the Social Democrats, um, and the first prime minister was, was a Social Democrat. Um, and so Czechoslovakia and President Benes, who did feel let down, kind of thought that he could play a bridge between East and West. And um, what was happening was that as, and, and one of the things is Stalin had systematically acquired his satellite empire by uh, fomenting coups and various aspects, but he thought that he could get Czechoslovakia to become communist by vote. Uh, and so they planned to win the majority. They'd only won the plurality um, in 46 and 48. And all of a sudden it became evident that they weren't going to win that. And so they started a series of kind of events that undermined the system um, and it's a complicated story where the democratic ministers trusted that democracy would work, um, and President Benish was older and weak. Uh, and it's, it's too complicated to tell all the details now, but basically it showed how fragile democracy is because there was a communist coup in 1948. And so uh, after all that, um, Czechoslovakia became, was a communist country, um, it had a brief period in 1968 of the Prague Spring, um, and then did not have freedom until 1989 when the wall came down and Václav Havel came on the scene. But it really is a story about major powers making decisions over the heads of small countries, of uh, the kinds of things that affect the psyche of a country, you know, who are friends, who are allies, 
Um, and then great power politics in, in terms of deals made during the war. The book really is on three levels. It, the inner part of the, the first level is my family story um, about my parents and the Jewish aspect of it. The second is how the war actually was carried out. And the third level is probably the hardest one is how difficult it is to make moral decisions. We all think that decisions are black or white. They're not. There are an awful lot of gray areas and trade-offs that are made. And this period, 37 to 48, shows a lot of them. I believe you quoted someone in the book as saying that democracy was actually mugged by democratic means. Which, yeah. And as I look at elections here, I realize how important it is right. that we make sure they're, uh, yeah. they're done right, because it was beautifully explained in the book how the elections were You were stolen, talking really. about the son of the president. Mm -hmm. Jan Masaryk was the foreign minister. And one of the things is when he came to Belgrade, and I was there giving flowers, um, I asked, he always had his uh, arm, his right arm in a sling. And I remember asking my father why was that, and he said he won't shake hands with communists. Um, and one of the things that he then was, there was a big dispute, or the, the communists tried to prove that he'd actually committed suicide by jumping out of the window. He, in fact, was pushed. But what happened was that in the foreign ministry now, when you go there, they have the bathroom where this was all supposed to have happened. And they had put a chair up next to the windowsill so that it would look as though he had gotten on the chair to jump out. Yeah. After having taken two sleeping pills, right. I believe he was able to do that. Yeah, it's yeah. Pretty, yeah. pretty amazing. But it's actually a wonderful uh, it, ending because of what happened. And I love the way you put that Poland took 10 years of hard work and, uh, to be liberated, Hungary 10 months, East Germany 10 weeks, and Czechoslovakia 10 days. Now, I know it didn't take 10 Definitely, days. Yeah for the Velvet Revolution because I met people in Czechoslovakia who told me how they would meet quietly and wouldn't tell their children what they thought and how they planned the revolution. But what a wonderful thing it must have been for you when you were able to go back and to meet Havel and uh, see your country free again. Well, I first went back to Czechoslovakia in 1967 with my American name, American passport, American husband. Uh, and what happened was that I found out from some friends of my parents that my father, my father came to the United States and defected, and so he was tried in absentia. And at the time I was told he'd been sentenced to death. As it turns out, that wasn't true. But uh, it made me wonder about going back there. Um, and so it was not until the 80s that I went back under the auspices of the U.S. Information Agency and stayed at the embassy so they could look out for me. And I remember kind of wandering around, and because I speak Czech, and um, trying to figure out what was going on and feeling just desperately sorry for this country that was subjected to communism. And so then the Velvet Revolution happens, and I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. At that time, I was vice chairman, and I went there in January 90, and um, I had gotten to be very good friends with the man who became the foreign minister at the time. He had been a reporter and had helped me on my dissertation. I'd written my dissertation on the role of the Czechoslovak press in 1968. So I go there, and... Uh, because life is so weird. He's the foreign minister. I used to go to the foreign ministry with my father when I was eight, and there I was in the same office that I'd sat in with my father. And, and Dean Spears says to me, so wouldn't you like to go meet President Havel? And I said, of course I would. So we go there, and he had been told he was going to meet with some American delegation. So my father had written a book on 20th century Czechoslovakia. So I'm giving him the book, and he said, I know who you are. You're Mrs. Fulbright. And I said, no, I'm Mrs. Albright. And, uh, and uh, so began a friendship. And then what happened was they were just setting up the president's office, uh, and they had no idea how to do it. And I said, well, I've just been in working for President Carter. Can I, can I help you? So we went and sat in a restaurant, and we drew, I drew charts for them about how presidential offices were set up. And, 
Um, and then I, I walked from the castle back down across Charles Bridge. It was snowing in January. And I had a, a genuine out-of-body experience thinking I'd never left here. And then I thought, well, obviously I had, because otherwise how would I know what a presidential office was like? <laughs> um, and so then what happened was President Havel came to the United States for his visit. And uh, they had just named a, a woman uh, ambassador, and we were all meeting in the Czech, Czechoslovak embassy at the time. And President Havel arrives with his whole speech that he gave in, in, for Congress on yellow paper that he'd written out. And it was in Czech, and he gave it to me and to this Rita Klimova and said, well, can you translate it so that I can give it tomorrow? So we sat up and translated it. And then he was in the Blair House practicing, and I went over there. And he starts reading it in English, and he said, this is impossible. That is not my word. I would never use this word. And so he gave the whole speech in Czech. But it was the beginning of a great friendship, and he was a really remarkable man. That, uh... and, uh, one of the things I find amazingly remarkable is, first you have the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, and then you have a Velvet Divorce. Uh, we all talk in Marin County about no-fault divorce, yeah. but I, I, when I was there, I couldn't believe that that could happen so peacefully. It must have been a lot of work. What, is he, what did he say about it? Well, I think it, it was interesting because among the various things in life that I grew up with that turns out not to be quite true is I did think that Czechoslovakia was this golden place. It turns out that the Czechs and Slovaks had never gotten along particularly well, and partially because the language is very similar and everything, but the Czech part had been under the Austrian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Slovak part under the Hungarians. Um, the Slovak part was much more agrarian, the Czech part more manufactured basis, and a number of different things. And the Slovaks, from what I learned later, felt really patronized by the Czechs um, and generally discriminated against. And so, um, I think because partially of what they were seeing that was going on in Yugoslavia uh, as that was breaking up, and partially because it was done through elections, um, they were able to have a velvet divorce. And what is interesting is they now actually do get along uh, as two separate countries. Um, and, and I think it is a testament to kind of the peaceful way that things can be done. But I think watching what was going on in Yugoslavia must have had something to do with it. And leadership that yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I can't help but think. Uh, I'm going to uh, move on to some of our questions because uh, there are more questions from the audience. And I apologize if I put some together. I know I have some from the students at Dominican University. And I know the students are all up there in the balcony. And uh, we're, I'm so glad you're here tonight because this book has so much to teach us all at wherever we are in our lives particularly those of you who are going to be our leaders in the future. I'm really glad you're here with us. Uh, I have a really interesting question. Somebody asked me uh, to ask you about uranium. And I did read a little bit about that in the book. Is uranium still an important thing in Czech Republic? Well, it's interesting. I mean, there are a lot of uh, questions about this. What happened was that there was, is a uranium mine in Czechoslovakia. Uh, it was, and one of the aspects that people talk about is that one of the reasons that the Russians wanted to liberate Czechoslovakia was in order to get some control over the uranium mines. Um, and there are those who think that it actually did help in terms of the way that they were then able to develop uh, nuclear weapons. Um, what was really weird about the place also is that people took uranium baths. Uh, and I actually, one of the times that I went to Czechoslovakia, and there was a congressional delegation with Senator Larry Pressler, he actually wanted to take a uranium bath that didn't make a lot of sense. Um, there are now discussions generally about a nuclear plant um, in, che in the Czech Republic, and there are questions about whether that should happen or not, especially since the Germans have decided to give up nuclear power plants. So, 
But there, what is interesting is, is whether one of the reasons that they did want to have liberate was in order to get control over that mine. Sounds, sounds yeah. sensible. Yeah. Yeah. I love this question. Uh, this person wants to know, when you see things going on in the world today, don't you just want to jump in and <laughs> do? <Yeah. laughs> well, let me say this. First of all, I loved being Secretary of State. I think that uh, anybody who knows me knows that is true. Um, and uh, there's certain parts, you know, when you are, um, it's hard to figure out that the words you say end up on the front page of a newspaper. Um, and um, actually, the first time I had a shock about that was when I was still ambassador to the United Nations. And I was uh, in talks in Geneva <clears throat> talking about Iraq. And um, I'm packing to go home, and all of a sudden I hear television say, today oil prices went up as a result of statements made by our ambassador to the United Nations, and I thought, God, what did I say? <laughs> uh, and so that was, and so, um, but you read the papers every morning, and you'd get the intelligence, and you'd think, I've got to do something about this. There is nothing strange, and what happens is your Secretary of State, under, uh, at least when this happened, uh, when you change parties and, and until noon of January 20th, and all of a sudden you're not. And um, so you depend on newspapers and not on all the intelligence. And you read, I remember sitting and reading the papers and thinking, I, I can't or won't or nobody's asking me to do anything about this. So it's a little bit of a shock at first. Then it's kind of a luxury. Uh, and then you try to figure out how to interfere in international affairs. Uh, <laughs> from a different vantage point, which is what I do now. <laughs> Please keep interfering, we yeah, need yeah. you. <laughs> I have to tell you what I've done is, I, uh, during the war in Kosovo, I invented something, which is, this sounds antediluvian at this point, is the international conference call. And I spoke to the major allies every single day on the phone. And we got to be very good friends as a result of all this. So when I left office, and um, I started getting calls from some of them. One was the British Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, who was head of the European Socialists. And he came out of a meeting, and he said, Madeline, there are terrible things. People are saying terrible things about the United States. Do something. <laughs> then I got a call from the former Dutch foreign minister, who talked to the former French foreign minister, who said, things are a mess. Call Madeline. So what happened was I created a group of former foreign ministers. And it's under the auspices of the Aspen Institute, so it has an official name, the Aspen Foreign Ministers Forum. Its unofficial name is Madeline and her exes. And uh, uh, we meet on a regular basis <laughs> and talk about whatever we want to talk about with absolutely no responsibility. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we talked a little while ago about the fact that um, a, uh, a, your seven-year-old granddaughter thinks Secretary of State is a woman's job, uh, yeah. which I loved knowing, but uh, what do you think of the chances? I have about six cards here that want to know what you think the chances of our having a woman president and uh, one that we're all interested in. Do you think that this will happen? I honestly don't know. I wish I did. Um, I, I do believe that at some point we will have a woman president. Dominican has a woman president, I think. Uh, okay. um, but I think that the following thing, we are always so proud of ourselves for being the first in everything. And there are many women heads of state in other parts of the world. Uh, I think that it will happen in the United States. Um, I obviously have a candidate, but I, I do think that uh, we don't, I think that um, the time will come. We hope so. Uh, there are several questions that are um, about your jewelry. And I know that you told some of us about yeah. your jewelry uh, beforehand, but uh, diplomacy by jewelry is something that I don't think any of the guys <laughs> Can I tell the story? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, let me just say, what, um, 
when I arrived at the United Nations, there are 15 members of the Security Council, and I was the only woman. I wasn't the first woman. Jean Kirkpatrick had been the first woman U.S. ambassador to the U.N. But as you know, I, I sat there with all these, these 14 men. They actually do diplomacy by ties, I think. Um, <laughs> but uh, what happened was that none of the jewelry stuff would have happened if it hadn't been for Saddam Hussein. Uh, because what did happen, I arrived at the UN in February 1993, and it was right after the Gulf War. And the ceasefire had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions. and. Um, the, uh, my, I was an instructed ambassador, and my instructions were to make sure those sanctions stayed on. And I w had to say perfectly terrible things about Saddam Hussein constantly, which he deserved. He had invaded Kuwait. So after a while, a poem appeared in the papers in Baghdad, comparing me to many things, but among them an unparalleled serpent. And I happened to have a snake pin. So I wore a snake pin um, whenever we talked about Iraq. And so um, then what happened was that, um, uh, you know, we have ambassadors go out and talk to the press after meetings. So all of a sudden, the cameras zero in, and they say, one of the reporters says, so why are you wearing that snake pit? And I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And then I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out, uh, and I bought a lot of costume jewelry. Uh, and on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. And, on bad days, a lot of insects and carnivorous animals. <laughs> um, and, um, and so the ambassadors would say, so what are we going to do today? And it was right after the first President Bush had said, read my lips, no new taxes. So I said, read my pins. And that is <laughs> how it started. And so they, they have, there's a show going around, and I have a book called Read My Pins. And For sale here. Uh, um, <laughs> And there's a, an exhibit going around. At the moment, it's at the Gerald Ford Library in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But uh, for instance, one of the things that happened was that we found that the Russians had actually been bugging the State Department uh, in a conference room not far away from the Secretary's office. And there was this man sitting outside listening to everything. So we did kind of the normal thing, which is which you say is do a demarche, is, is let the Russians know that this was unacceptable. But the next time I met the Russian foreign minister, I wore this huge bug, and he knew exactly uh, what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could ask questions here all night. Um, I will ask one more. And uh, people are asking about oil. I have several questions about that and how that affects about, foreign so. oil and how it affects foreign policy. Well, uh, first of all, I have always not liked the concept that our foreign policy is based on getting oil. I do not think it is. Uh, we, our foreign policy, I think, is based on um, trying to make sure that the American country is secure and uh, that our national interests are carried out. And that, in many ways, for me, means that one cares about um, what is going on in terms of how countries, how people treat each other within the country, relationships of, among countries. However, oil clearly does have an important role. What I th is interesting is that um, we, I've been now in a number of different discussions that um, are saying basically that a lot of things are going to change because of our um, now discovery of uh, 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 shale, uh, oil, gas, and natural gas in a number of different ways that uh, we could, in fact, become energy independent. Something that I never thought was possible, but I think that clearly with the new discoveries, that is something that um, is potentially possible that changes a lot of the equation. Clearly, most of the oil that we have used has come out of the Middle East. Uh, and so it has created a dependency on that part of the world with some regimes that are less than democratic. So I think that there are issues that may, in fact, change some of the, uh, the balance, but we don't know yet. Um, but I, I hate to think that we are, and I don't believe it, as I've said, that 
our national security policy is determined by oil, but it clearly plays an important part. And there are a lot of discussions, obviously, about the climate change aspects of using fossil fuel, um, also discussions about using nuclear energy in a number of different ways. So the whole usage of energy uh, in terms of the 21st century country uh, and the entire world is obviously something that is part of uh, an overall discussion and does change kind of the balance of, of various parts of our relationships. I have another serious question here on a card. Uh, because you were, have been to North Korea and you were representing our government there, can you comment a little bit about where we are with North Korea? I think you may yeah. be the only person who could tell us that. Well, it's again, nothing, I, I can never give a short answer aside from the fact that I am a professor, so I have to. Uh, but I think that clearly our relationship with North Korea since the end of World War II has been a very complicated one of the, the division of the peninsula, uh, the Korean War, um, and various aspects of, of that relationship. Then what happens, and again, when um, the Clinton administration came in, um, what had happened was that the North Koreans, they were signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and they also were threatening, at the, every various years they've been threatening towards South Korea. Um, we then were very concerned about what happened in 93 when they started talking about pulling out, uh, began to try to figure out what was going on there in terms of their energy needs, frankly. They were saying that they felt threatened because they did not have energy. We then worked out an agreement with them um, that was uh, an agreed framework about how, in fact, um, they would be supplied with crude oil and uh, helped if they did not develop their own nuclear programs. They made that deal, and then what happened was, for a number of reasons, neither side really honored the deal. So that already broke down whatever relationship we were working on in the 90s. Um, then things got very bad, there's no question. They kept threatening in a number of different ways, and uh, President Clinton asked former uh, Secretary of Defense Bill Perry to come up with some kind of a program about how to deal with this. And we came to one of those kind of forks in the road, which was we said to the North Koreans, you have an opportunity to negotiate or we will, in fact, uh, press you and potentially use force. They said, let's negotiate. So what happened was um, I, uh, this was like, this, and by the way, the North Koreans are, they have no sense of time as far as I could tell in terms of their negotiations, wherever it was in New York or... So in the summer of 2000, uh, Vice Marshal Cho, the number two guy uh, in North Korea, came over and he came to my office as secretary in a pinstripe three-piece suit uh, and we had a perfectly decent conversation. We then go to the Oval Office where he wears his uniform with a lot of medals for what he had gotten in killing Americans in uh, uh, the Korean War. And he then gave President Clinton a red folder in which it was the invitation for him to come to North Korea. So President Clinton said, well, maybe at some point, but it's inappropriate for me to go there without knowing what's going on, so the Secretary of State will go. And they weren't real thrilled about that. The bottom line was that uh, we had no embassy in North Korea, and also we had um, very, very limited knowledge about Kim Jong-il at the time. Uh, our intelligence said he was crazy and a pervert. Um, <laughs> I found out he wasn't crazy. Uh, so, uh, uh, that, so, what happens is I arrive, and we had no idea whether I could have meetings or not, since we had no embassy. So I get put into a guest house, and the first message that comes over was that nobody would talk to me unless I went to see his embalmed father. So I, have to, I go and see his embalmed father, at which point I get a message saying that, um, uh, Kim Jong-il would see me. So we have a press conference, and it was like something out of the 50s with these old cameras, 
were standing there next to each other. We were about the same height. I knew that I had on high heels. Then I looked over at him. He had high heels. Uh, and his hair was a lot poofier than mine. So uh, we then embarked on a series of very long talks. And this is what was interesting, was that he, um, he didn't have a lot of advisors around him. He had somebody that was doing interpretation for him. But we had very serious talks about missile limits, um, I had, in fact, signed an agreement with this Vice Marshal Cho saying that we had no um, uh, threatening uh, aspects towards them or vice versa. Um, and we talked about all kinds of very technical things. And then in the, he said, and I have prepared a surprise for you. Um, we're not going to the circus, which is what somebody had told you. What I've arranged is to redo the... Um, great celebration that we had for the 60th anniversary of the Workers' Party. So we go to this incredible stadium where there must have been 100,000 people, and all of a sudden there is this huge performance. And among the things that happened, one of the things we were nervous about was they had developed something called the Taipo Dong missile. So they had, you know, the flashcards that people do at football games here, and so they had these great tableaus of the great leader in the fields and various things. And all of a sudden, they were so good at the flashcards that they made this missile go up. And so he turns to me and he says, that's the last one of our missiles. And so we had this kind of thing going back and forth. Um, and what was fascinating was, um, that we're sitting there and, and he's got his interpreter and he said, so how does my interpreter compare with Kim Dae-jung, who was the president of South Korea? And I thought, I'm gonna get this interpreter killed. So I said, <laughs> Kim Dae-jung has the best woman interpreter I've heard in the world, but you have a great interpreter. And then he said, I would like to have Korean Americans come here and teach uh, English. So we had a number of different things going on, but there was the election of November 2000. Many Americans were confused by the election of November 2000, um, but certainly the North Koreans were. And I hold no brief for the North Koreans, none whatsoever. Kim Jong-il was an evil dictator and his people were eating bark off the trees, but we were in the middle of negotiations. And the Bush people come in. Colin Powell was very interested in continuing what I had done. Uh, and a, a headline appears in the Washington Post saying, Powell to continue Clinton policies. He was hauled into the Oval Office and told no. So we have had a complete breakdown on this. And now, of course, uh, Kim Chung Jung, the young guy, does, is trying to prove his worth. I think we are in very serious trouble. Um, and uh, the question is, who has any influence on them? And the hope is that the Chinese actually do, though the Chinese themselves are very nervous about having the whole place fall apart and having millions of refugees cross into China and then not having a buffer between them and South Korea. So I think it is very, very serious. I think they do lie to us and bluff and um, we are trying to figure out what the right tools are to deal with them. So, and the UN at this moment is considering an additional sanctions on North Korea. So, it's a very bad story, I think. That, Indeed. That, it is. Sorry, that was a very long answer. It was, that, a, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. it was a, an amazing answer. I want to know more about um, the perversion part, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that. Uh, yeah. I, we must stop because uh, we have a sellout audience and I know everyone wants to have a book signed by you. But I just want to thank you again for this, all the service you've done to our country and the world and especially for this treasure. We were only able to touch on it tonight. I just hope that everyone is going to have a wonderful experience. Take tomorrow off. Yeah. <laughs> Read yeah. Frog Winter. You're going to love you it. Thank you for your great Thank you for your kindness. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.